So if you've been to one of our church services recently, uh, you might realize whether that's online or physically, uh, you probably will have noticed that we've said the Nicene Creed a number of times. And coming from a Pentecostal background or a, a low church setting, it's sometimes might be considered strange. Why are we uh, saying some of these old creeds? Why are we bringing them back into our services? Um, are you not people who say no creed but the Bible? Uh, is the Bible the standard of our faith or is it the creed or anything else? But the question remains, how do you rightly interpret the Bible? And that's one of the, the pressing questions of our age and of every age uh, since the beginning of Christianity. How do you rightly interpret the word of God? There's so many denominations, especially so many Protestant denominations, that prove that the teachings of the Bible aren't as self-evident as we wish that they were. Okay, all of us take things differently, we interpret things slightly differently. And according to a recent Lifeway survey, 78% of evangelicals said they agreed with the statement Jesus was the first and the greatest being created by God the Father. Now that statement isn't Trinitarian Christianity at all. It is a heresy called Arianism that was condemned a very long time ago. And that statement is Arian, okay? Um, we've forgotten the creeds and therefore we've forgotten some of what we believe. Jesus isn't the first and greatest being created by God the Father. He is God himself. He's the Logos, the word who's come down to us and taken um, flesh from the Virgin Mary. Okay, so if we look at this just quick pie chart, which you can just grab off uh, Wikipedia, you can see, you know, how the so much when you look at the Protestant side, how much divergence there is. You know, there's Baptists, there's Presbyterian Reformed, there's Methodists, there's Lutherans, and then there's, you know, Charismatic Christianity, Pentecostalism, as well as Anabaptists and other things. There's Anglicanism. There's a variety of ways of interpreting the scriptures. Uh, we accept that there are differences among us and we accept other believers as Christians. Uh, they are definitely Christians. They've got a relationship with Jesus Christ, but we disagree with them on certain things. Uh, an example would be, do we baptize infants or do we only baptize adult believers? 77% uh, of the world Christianity is infant Baptists, whilst only 23% baptize just believing adults. In the early church, there was a divergence of opinion on this, and um, many saints, you know, um, such as like St. Augustine, were baptized as adults, not as little children, even though they had at least one believing parent. So, you know, there are um, reasons to go to the Baptist uh, and only baptized adult believers, but also we have to accept that there's many faithful believers in Christ who hold different opinions to us. Um, and they've got biblical reasons for doing so. Anyone who spends any time with a Presbyterian um, who knows their Bible very well, and they're very evangelical, will know that they believe that the Bible teaches infant baptism, okay? You know, you just have to read their books or have a debate with them or come to an understanding. Uh, and you can see they've got biblical reasons why they believe that infants should be baptized. OK, this isn't just, you know, we're right, they're wrong or whatever we have to accept. So, you know, here's an example uh, from a Baptist website, you know, of, you know, the covenant of grace being in different administrations in the Old Testament as Abrahamic, the Mosaic, the Davidic and the New Covenant. You know, so they just see that the Old Testament saints are saved in exactly the same way uh, by believing in the covenant of grace, covenant of promise, as in the new covenant, and that they're not different things. And therefore, because babies were circumcised in the Old Testament, so babies should be baptized in the New Testament. And, you know, there's a, that's, you know, how a, uh, a Presbyterian, someone believing the Westminster Confessions would phrase it, and would come to an understanding of that. And if you're a Baptist, you would have a different understanding, you know, that the, the new covenant is new that it is something very different. And that's why uh, adults are baptized, okay? Uh, there's, you know, Jesus' phrase, this is my body. 
do we take that literally at face value? Uh, this is my body, okay, so as you know, Lutherans and Anglicans would take that more literally? Or do you say, this is sort of like my body? And, you know, and there's obviously this funny meme about it, things Jesus never said, this is sort of like my body. It's, so you know, there's various ways of interpreting some of these texts. Do we take them on literal value that I died and was buried when I was baptized? My baptism is my union with Christ, okay? And if you accept that on face value, okay, then you, know, you, you go to different ways of viewing things than you were if you take them symbolically or it's about a spiritual baptism or other things. You know, the, we don't take things exactly literally all of the time. We all come to the text with an interpretive framework in our minds and therefore we we don't just say we believe it because it says this okay all of us have an interpretation and a framework in mind when we come to the bible and you know there will be those who disagree with us that the trinity is self-evident in the scriptures so obviously you know you've got mormonism and others but and do jehovah's witnesses um oneness pentecostalism within pentecostalism at the very beginning, there was a massive split over whether or not the Trinity was, in fact, in the Bible and it was a teaching taught by the scriptures. And so you had oneness Pentecostals who left in, you know, there's six million of them in the world who, you know, believe, you know, in the baptism uh, of the Holy Spirit and believe in speaking in tongues. But they also deny the Trinity and say that the Trinity is a false doctrine that was invented in the early church. OK, so, you know, there's a difference of opinion on many of these things and that's why creeds are important because they give us a statement of what we believe and what we believe the christian church has always believed taught and confessed so when we go back to the early church there was many different competing form of christianity you know so we've got the donatists the sabellianists the uh arians the gnostics um you know, and you've got other sort of other groups like the Manichaeans um, and Marcionism, you know, so there's these various different groups who've got different understandings of who Jesus Christ was and what he accomplished, whether he was in fact fully human or if he was just a spirit who appeared as a human um, or if he was a man who was then adopted as the son of God at his baptism and lots of different teachings going on about who Jesus Christ was. And so the creeds developed as a way of saying, this is how we're going to interpret the scripture. It's a rule of faith. So it's the ruler that you hold up against the scriptures and say, this is how we're going to interpret the, the Christian faith in the Old Testament. So if we think of you know, the, the, the prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament as being puzzle pieces scattered throughout the Old Testament, which when you put together, you can make the face of uh, a crucified and risen Messiah. If you don't have the, the final piece, you can assemble the pieces in different ways. And you can come to very different conclusions about who Jesus Christ was and who um, the Messiah should be. Was, was he going to be a, a man who overthrew the Romans? Um, in which case you're still waiting for him because that hasn't happened. Uh, how you interpret Old Testament prophecy depends on the picture that you've got at the end, okay? And so the, the creed is the picture it is the, the formula through which you then look at the Old Testament and you can interpret all of the Old Testament through the lens of the creed. That I believe in one Father, one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. That The Father is the maker of heaven and earth. It's not another separate God out there who's the maker of heaven and earth. And the Father is a distant God who sends Jesus Christ to rescue us from being trapped into the material world uh, because of the sins of Sophia or Chochma or whatever, as Gnostic teachers and others were teaching people. You know, and they interpreted the Old Testament in a very different way than how we would interpret the Old Testament, okay? So some, there were some Gnostic sects who interpreted that the, the serpent in the Garden of Eden story is the good guy because he's the one who awakens us to enlightenment, to knowledge, and shows us how that we're no longer kept in darkness and knowledge. So you can see that you could interpret the Old Testament very differently, in very different ways, um, if you don't have the, the key, which is the creed. Okay, so why the creeds? No creed but the Bible is good, but it means you're going to get a variety of opinion. And sometimes 
people will then say, well, the Trinity isn't in the Bible. The word Trinity is not in the Bible, therefore we don't need that. And we start throwing out all these other things which are held sacred and have always been believed by Christians, okay? So where do we get the creeds from? And the creeds are lifted from the pages of scripture. And they're often lifted from passages in which Paul and others define the gospel for us. So here in Romans 1, 2 to 5, God promised the good news, this good news long ago through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. The good news is about his son. In his earthly life, he was born into King David's family line. He was shown to be the son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through Christ, God has given us the privilege and authority as apostles to tell Gentiles everywhere that God has done for them so that they will believe and obey him, bringing glory to his name. So just in summary, Paul's key points there at the beginning of Romans, the good news is God's promised this long ago through the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. The good news is about the son. It is earthly life. He was born into King David's family line. He was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. And all of those points are going to feed into the creed, okay? And then we've got 1 Corinthians 15. Again, this is a passage in which Paul defines for us the gospel. Let me remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news. So he's going to remind us of the good news. And that's great because now we have Paul's good news. He's going to tell us what he believes the gospel, the good news to be. He goes, I passed on to you what was most important, which had been passed on to me, that Christ died for our sins, just as the scriptures say. He was buried and raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scriptures say. He was seen by Peter, then by the 12. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom were still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all of the apostles. Okay, so Paul here defining the good news as Christ dying for our sins. He was buried and raised from the third on the dead on the third day, and he was seen by Peter and then by the 12. So he died buried, raised, and seen. And all of these points, again, are going to feed into the creed that he died, that he was buried, that he raised, and then he was seen by many. Okay, Philippians 2, um, 6 through to 11. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names. So the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So the summary of this passage, he was God. He was born as a human being. He died a criminal's death on the cross and God elevated him to the place of higher of highest honor. So you know, it's all about the incarnation. The Logos came down and took on that human flesh from the Virgin Mary. He died on a cross the, the Lord of glory was crucified well and truly, and God has elevated him in the ascension to the place of highest honor, okay? And so these various pictures of the gospel story from Paul are then combined into an eight-point gospel presentation, as it were, okay? This is the story of Jesus Christ. The gospel, the good news, is concerning the Son. It's good news about Jesus Christ, about who he is, Okay, it's his story, not our story. Okay, so the good news is about Jesus and about who he was for us. Okay, and this is Matthew Bates' summary. So Jesus pre existed with the Father, he became incarnate and fulfilled the promise to David. He died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried, he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. He appeared to many, showing that he truly was raised from the dead. He's seated at God's right hand as Lord, and he will come again as judge. So you can see from those passages of scripture that we've just lifted from all of these points. Okay, the only one that wasn't in those was he will come again as judge. And that's in other places in scripture, you know, that uh, the one whom will judge the world is the one who God 
um, raised from the dead, Paul says elsewhere, you know, that um, his raising of this man from the dead is the proof that he will be the judge of the world, you know, so we can go to other places in scripture to get that point. First Corinthians 15, three to seven includes the, the earliest version of the creed about Jesus' death and resurrection as it was received by Paul. So Paul, you know, this is before the gospels have been written. Paul's writing this. Uh, we think about five years after the death of Christ, uh, possibly originating within the Jerusalem community. This is how they are saying, this is the good news. This is how we interpret the events of Jesus Christ. Even before the gospels have been written, that he died, he rose again from the dead. He was seen by others. Okay. Uh, the old Roman creed is the earliest form perhaps a version of the Apostles' Creed. Uh, it was based in the second century rules of faith that we see within the writings of the Church Fathers. Um, and this was a declaration of faith for those who would receive baptism. Those who came as adult believers to be baptized, they would have to declare that they believe these things. Uh, by the fourth century, the tripartite structure following uh, Matthew 28, 19 of the Father, the Son, and then the Holy Spirit is how that those points had now been ordered. They'd been ordered according to the doctrine of the Trinity. First, we talk about the Father, then we talk about the Son, then we talk about the Holy Spirit. And the Son obviously takes up the most part of the creed uh, because he's the one who came down for us and for our salvation, but also because that's the most disputed aspect within the early church. Who was this man, Jesus of Nazareth? Okay. And the Apostles' Creed is widely used by most Christian denominations for both liturgical and uh, to teach in catechisms, you know, to, to um, instruct new believers in the faith. The Nicene Creed reflects the concerns of the First Council of Nicaea, 325, so that's to condemn Arianism, that belief which apparently 80% of American evangelicals hold to, which is crazy, um, the, the chief purpose that the Nicene Creed combats is that belief, okay? Um, so here's Arrhenius. His, um, so Arrhenius, you know, was familiar with people who had known John himself, you know, who wrote the Gospel of John and the Apocalypse, the Book of Revelation. Uh, so Arrhenius knew people who knew John, you know, so he's connected going back. Um, and this is what he's received and what he puts in his work against heresies. Uh, he goes, this is the faith in one God, the Father Almighty, who made heaven and earth, and the seas and all the things that are in them, in one Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who was made flesh for our salvation, and in the Holy Spirit, who made known through the prophets the plan of salvation, the coming, the birth from a virgin, the passion, the resurrection from the dead, and the bodily ascension into heaven of the beloved Christ Jesus our Lord and his future appearing from heaven in the glory of the Father to sum up all things and to raise anew all flesh of the whole human race. So you can see that this is a very proto form of the creeds. And Arrhenius is writing within the second century, and this is how he's seeing it uh, from his perspective. This is what he's been handed down as this, you know, if you want to be baptized, you need to believe these things, okay? Uh, this is the old Roman symbol, so the proto-form of what would become the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was born of the Holy Spirit and of the Virgin Mary, who under Pontius Pilate was crucified and buried. On the third day, rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven, sits at the right hand of the Father, whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. And in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Church, the remissions of sin, the resurrection of the flesh, and of life everlasting. So you can see these points, you know, the resurrection. It's going to be the resurrection of the flesh. We believe in the Father Almighty and in Jesus Christ, his Son. Okay, we believe all these things. Okay, it's this summary. So here's the evolution of that into the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. That's an important point, that the Father is the maker of heaven and earth. There's not two gods, one who created the physical world and one who creates the spiritual world, but there is one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate. This thing happened in history. 
that there was a guy called Pontius Pilate and Jesus suffered under him. Okay, it wasn't just some sort of spiritual metaphor. It really happened in history that he was crucified, died and was buried. He descended into hell. And on the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From hence, he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and of life everlasting. Amen. Okay, and so this, again, is sort of evolves into the Nicene Creed, okay? And this is where they're going to try and fight against Arianism, that belief that apparently nearly 80% of evangelical Christians in America hold to about Jesus being created rather than him being the only begotten son of the Father, okay? That he's very God of very God. And that's the language that Nicene Creed wants to use because they want to say, who is this Jesus? Who is this guy? He is very God of very God. He's not a created being. He's not a supremely created being like the Archangel Michael. No, he is God himself. God really did come down from heaven. Okay, so um, the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, all things visible and invisible. In one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom are all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit, the Virgin Mary, and was made man, was crucified also under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. On the third day, he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and, you know, in the Latin version in the West and the Son who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke with the prophets. I believe in one holy Christian or Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins and look for the resurrection of dead and life in the world to come. Amen. And that's just the, the summary of what all Christians believed at this time. And that's why it's received by the Presbyterians, it's received by the Anglicans, it's received by the Lutherans, it's received by the Protestants, as this is what we as Christians believe even hold dear to because it tells us about Christ and it's teaching us about him and it is the rule through which we interpret the Old Testament when we read the Old Testament and we see talk about God or gods we believe it to be the one God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth and so although we hear about Chokmah and Sophia and all these other ideas in the Old Testament wisdom divine wisdom we do not see these as other gods Okay, they're not other gods, okay? Because there is one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, who's revealed himself as uh, the one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. He's begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, okay? Being of one substance with the Father. Okay, so it's very clear what they're trying to say and what they're trying to not say. So I hope that's helpful. I hope that's uh, trying to come across of why we in the parks, in DC, in the parks, believe that saying the Nicene Creed is important and it's why creeds are important today. They reveal to us how we should interpret the Old Testament. They reveal to us how we should speak of Jesus Christ. And that's why we say them.